The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Glenda Cleasy. I'm the Agronomy Specialist with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers. And with me today is Andrea Lauder, Communications Manager also with Saskatchewan Pulse Growers, um, who's organized the webinar for us today. So thank you, Andrea. Without you, these webinars just wouldn't be possible. Welcome to the first webinar of the 2018 Pulse webinar series. We have four additional webinars scheduled this year, and a list of our webinars can be found on the SPG website under News and Events tab. Topics that will be covered in upcoming webinars include micronutrients in pulse production, understanding and managing MRLs to maintain our export markets, and insect scouting in pulse crops. As a reminder, CCA and CCSC credits are available. To get CCA credits for today's webinar, you must be watching it live. For those who have attended the webinar, Andrea will send out an email after the webinar requesting your CCA number. At this time, you can respond with your number. If more than one person is watching with you, um, please send all of the numbers for everyone who's in attendance. The webinar will be recorded and posted to the SPG website for future viewing for those who are unable to attend or who want to look back at the material that was covered. For today's webinar, all participants will be muted. We would be happy to take your questions. So to ask a question, please type it into the question box located in the GoToWebinar dashboard. You can send questions at any time throughout the webinar, but we will hold the questions until the end of the presentation. Our speaker today is Krista Anderson. Krista is a Seed Growth Development Manager with Bayer Crop Science. Krista grew up on a mixed farm north of Purdue, Saskatchewan and accidentally discovered her passion for plant disease while pursuing her BSc in biology at the University of Saskatchewan. Upon completing her degree, she joined the Pulse Pathology team at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Saskatoon Research Centre, got a few years of practical experience under her belt, and then left to travel the UK and Europe. She ultimately concluded that backpacking was a great experience, but not her best career choice, so she returned to Canada to pursue her MSc in plant pathology on lentil and thracnose. Krista has been with Bayer Crop Science for over a decade, managing their seed treatment research facility and overseeing a portion of the seed growth field research program. When not elbow deep in the seed treater, Krista enjoys planning her next big travel adventure, yoga and kayaking. Krista is going to speak to us today on seed treatments in pulse production. So I now turn the presentation over to you, Krista. Thank you, Glenda. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak today. Um, and I'll have to put a, an apology out there um, right at the start. I'm fighting off a bit of a cold, so I have a bit of a tickle in my throat. I may have to pause periodically to take a sip of water. Um, and if you hear me go on mute for any length of time, it's because I am having a coughing fit, but I will really try and avoid those. So please bear with me. Um, bear with me. So I want to talk to you a bit about seed treatment today, um, and specifically about using um, risk analysis to make some decisions. Um, and actually, just to follow up on what Glenda said, uh, I've, I've got a fair amount of experience uh, with the pulse pathology. It's, it's part of my program now, although not my focus. It was my past. Um, and uh, seed growth development, that's the bear speak for seed treatment. Um, I manage our seed treatment research lab in Saskatoon, where I basically get experimental products coming off the off the lab bench in Germany, and then I do do studies on them to see how well they fit into the Canadian uh, marketplace and uh, deal with our issues. Um, I am mainly focused in the lab, but I do have some responsibility for field research programs. I don't actually do the work anymore, um, but I do create programs for some of our local field reps to run. Uh, okay. So what I want to cover today, I want to talk a little about some of the changes in seed treatment technology. Certainly since I've been in the, the industry for the last 15 years, there have been um, some significant changes. And even just prior to that, there were some substantial changes. Um, so I'll talk about that a little bit, just give you a bit of a background. Uh, really what I want to focus on is helping you understand your risk factors and then using those to select an appropriate seed treatment. And that's where the bulk of the, uh, the presentation will be on. I will talk a little bit about how to maximize your seed treatment performance and some of the appropriate expectations that you should have of your seed treatment. So, <clears throat> a very brief history. Seed treatments and the concept of seed treating has actually been around for hundreds of years. Um, people took advantage of compounds or products that were immediately available to them. 
Uh, they weren't very complex. They were quite crude. Um, and mainly what they were targeting were surface floor and smuts and bumps in their cereals and some of the storage insects. Um, and as you can see from the, the photo, there are some, some ladies treating some seed in our river um, way back when. Uh, very, uh, the application methods like the seed treatments themselves were, were quite primitive. About the 1800s, they started to move forward a bit. There was actually compounds manufactured specifically or sold specifically for use as a seed treatment. Um, as you can see from the list there, uh, human health and environmental safety was not high on the list of, um, of uh, concerns at the time. And uh, all of these compounds, uh, the one thing that was similar across all of them, they all had a, what we call a contact activity. And I'll explain a little, explain a little bit more about that in an upcoming um, slide. But this was also about the time where we saw the first specialized seed treating equipment. Um, and that bottom photo is of a Gustafson Model H seed treater that came out, I think, in the 1930s. Um, and certainly some of the seed treatment equipment is, is in some cases, um, very similar, but has also come a long way. Post-World War II, obviously, the mercurial-based um, compounds, not so good. Uh, the country started to ban their use, and so there was an introduction of these non-mercurial um, organic fungicides, primarily. <clears throat> I'll go into what I call the early modern formulations, um, and these sort of came about with the identification of systemic active ingredients. Um, and what that means, uh, so for a contact active, the active ingredient actually has to come in physical contact with the organism that it's trying to manage versus with a systemic active ingredient, it's actually taken up by the plant into the tissues, um, and some of them are more, more highly systemic than others, but it's taken into the plant, and so it can actually act on um, the organism that is already present, perhaps, in the plant, or that is um, introduced into the plants uh, a little bit later, it could be separated by space or time. They also opened up the range of disease and pests that could potentially be managed, um, as opposed to the contact actives. We also saw the introduction of multi-active formulations. Most of these were dual actives. You might have a fungicide and an insecticide. Um, they did have a reduced toxicity profile compared to those pre post World War II um, um, compounds. And the formulations themselves were often oil-based. Um, and I mentioned that just because the oil-based formulations were not fun to clean up, uh, but they, they probably arose because there was a significant portion of the seed treatment um, that actually were spin-offs of oil companies and a lot of their scientists were from the petroleum industry and actually a fair number of them actually came from the paint industry. Moving into what I call the more modern formulation, um, those early systemic actives were quite generalist. They uh, had some efficacy on a broad range of organisms, but they weren't really good on any of them in particular. Our modern actives, they're much more specialized, they're highly efficacious against the target organism, but they may not necessarily have as wide a, a range that they're active against. There's also a much more uh, greater focus on the environmentally responsible actives. Um, those multi-active offerings are becoming more and more complex, and we've moved from mostly oil-based formulations into water-based formulations, which has made cleanup a lot easier. And we're also seeing a continual improvements in the application equipment. From a, a, just a quick comment on formulations and uh, some of the properties that we look at when we're developing a formulation. Obviously, the physical and chemical stability of a formulation is critical. The physical stability is actually about how well that active ingredient stays suspended within um, the formulation itself. The chemical stability is looking at the actives and how well they, um, whether or not they degrade over time. So those are critical factors. They play into the shelf life and storage recommendations that you'll see on the label. Uh, viscosity and flowability may or may not be a focus. Uh, sometimes it depends on the, the manufacturer or perhaps what crop they're being sold into. Uh, viscosity, obviously, how thick is that formulation? Does it move through your equipment well? How does it perform under cold conditions? Flowability is often associated with once it's on the seed, does it restrict or inhibit the flow of the seed? Storage restrictions are also a consideration, um, being in Canada and treating in rather cool conditions. Uh, we like to have some sort of, of um, 
antifreeze present in our formulations so that things don't thicken up or freeze up if uh, they're exposed to some sub-zero temperatures. Adherence to seed, if the formulation doesn't stay on the seed, it's not going to work for you, so that's critical. Distribution on seed, that refers to the seed to seed tra um, transfer or, or distribution. Um, how well does it spread on a seed surface? Does it spread to other seed surfaces when it's wet? Uh, that, that can play a role in coverage. Your seed safety and phytotoxicity. This is in particular, once you put that active ingredient and the formulation with all of the inerts onto the seed, is there the potential for it to harm the seed, cause a reduction in germination, um, that type of thing. And that's something we look at closely. And then obviously there's the color. We, we want to ensure that uh, we are in, um, um, <clears throat> we're working with the Seeds Act and we're in compliance with the Seeds Act by ensuring there's a color um, either in the formulation or available to use with that color, color or with that formulation. Just to give you a quick idea of all the different components or forms that a formulation could come in, um, this is just an example of what you might encounter. This is not by any means all of the types of formulations you might see, but those dry powders and dust and the wettable powders, those are typically associated with the older um, formulations and I, I, there aren't very many left on the market. Um, they tend to have a higher risk from an uh, occupational exposure perspective, so we try and stay away from them. Um, and with most of the equipment today, the liquid formulations are much easier to work with. And they can be as simple as a, a simple liquid solution that has an active ingredient and a colorant and maybe a solvent. You can get your emulsions um, where you have your oils um, in, in water with some, uh, some additional inerts um, that make the formulation with handling. Um, and the flowable suspensions are probably the most common uh, formulation that you're gonna encounter on the market today. So, and they could have any range of inert compounds in addition to the active ingredients. You can have your colorants, your pigments, suspending agents to ensure that active ingredient stays suspended within the formulation. Your dispersants, your stickers, de-dusters, um, antifreeze components, defoamers, biocides, waters, and there are more that you could potentially end up in the formulation. Um, it just depends on the particular uh, manufacturer, how well the active ingredient interacts with all of those inerts. Um, the active ingredients themselves, some of them are very easy to work with. Some of them can be quite complex um, and require a lot of effort to get them to um, do what you want them to do within the formulation. So one thing I want to start on now, talking about risk. Uh, most of you have probably seen a disease triangle. I've sort of... Um, taken it upon myself to shift it a bit and talk about risk triangle from a seed treatment perspective, because there's really three basic components that are going to contribute to your risk and which you should consider when you're selecting your seed treatment. One of them is the seed itself, quite obvious. Um, if there's a disease um, present in the seed, if you've got seed with low germination or vigor, physical damage, so those are all going to have a higher risk associated with them. So each of those components um, you can throw into there as a contributor to risk. Um, and this is not by all means a comprehensive list, but these are probably the most common ones that you're going to have to deal with or, or consider. The environment that you'll be putting that seed into with increasing moisture is increasing risk. Uh, heavy soils versus a, a light uh, sandy, sandy loam soil is going to have a higher risk. If there's nutrient deficiencies, you're actually going to be at a higher risk because your, your plants and your seedlings themselves aren't going to be as healthy and vigorous and will be more. Um, more prone to, to some of the soil-borne pathogens. And speaking of which, the presence of the soil soil-borne pests and pathogens, um, if you've had previous issues, you are more likely to have future issues. And if you're practicing short rotations, that actually does a lot to contribute to the inoculum load in your soil, and it's something that you need to consider. <clears throat> so um, are there some tools out there to help you figure out your risk? Well, it's a good news, bad news type of thing. Uh, from an economic threshold and predictive model perspective, there aren't very many out there for insect tests. And I, I hesitate to say, I, I don't think there are any for those targeted by seed treatments. Most of the models out there are for foliar insects. There's virtually non-existent when it comes to predicting risk from your soil-borne pathogens. But there are some reliable recommendations for seed-borne disease. And I'll touch on a couple of those. But certainly for more information on specific diseases and um, the seedborne diseases, the Fast Gag and Food has uh, on their website, they have some, some guidance in that area as well. 
One of the things you can do is scout and monitor for your pests and pathogens and get them accurately identified. It'll help you make decisions. Now, the downside is scouting isn't going to help you in season. It won't help you make that decision for this year, um, but it will be helpful for future years in, in making decisions. It's, it's a good idea to gather information over multiple years, keep field notes on each of your, your fields, um, and then go back to them when you're making your decision, you know, the next year or two or three years down the road even. You want to make sure you note recurring issues. If possible, you want to collect samples and send them for proper identification. And there's the Crop Protection Lab down in Regina that can help you do that. Although I would encourage you, before you collect samples and send them, talk to the lab and find out how you should actually be doing that. Um, because if you can do a proper sampling, it will um, ensure that they are, are helping you to identify what the actual problem is. Um, and it'll make their job easier in doing that analysis as well. I definitely recommend getting a seed test done. Um, as we talked about in that risk triangle, germination, vigor, the presence of disease will play a role in determining your risk factor. And that's something that you have control over is understanding your seed quality. Should you disease screen your soil? Um, I, I haven't made up my mind on this one. I think in some instances it's helpful, uh, but it may not give you a lot of information that you can use. My, and, and when we get into talking about the soil borne diseases, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there are some specific diseases, it might be worthwhile, uh, and a lot of them, it, there's really no point in my mind. Uh, but I'll talk about those as we go on, and if anyone has any questions on it, feel free to ask for sure. So, continuing on, some of the tools to help you manage your risk, preventative measures are great, and um, you'll hear this as a recurring theme, crop rotation is the most powerful management tool available to you. So it's not a seed treatment, but I would be remiss if I did not point that out. It is the most important thing you can actually do from a management perspective. And use the best seed available to you. That's critical. Now, using appropriate measures, you want to select a product that's going to manage the disease or insects or combination um, of which you know you have a problem. And that comes back to the seed test um, and your previous year of scouting to understand which ones those are. And something else is application quality will affect the product efficacy. So it's important that you know your equipment. You can take a premium product, but if you don't do a good job of applying it, you will not get your return on investment and you won't get the maximum value out of it. <clears throat> so when it comes to selecting a seed treatment, as I said, seed selection, critical. Test your seed. Um, always use the best seed available to you. Good germination, good vigor. These are important. Seed that is physiologically old or that has a uh, slow or poor germination um, and isn't very vigorous, they stay in the ground longer. It takes them longer to emerge. They're exposed for a longer period of time to your soil-borne pathogens. And they actually, because of the exudates that they release from their roots because they're an older seed, is actually more attractive to those soil-borne pathogens. And obviously, you want to pick some seed that has no or low disease presence. Um, and one thing to keep in mind, seed treatments will improve the performance, performance of disease seed or even of those with, um, you know, a moderate uh, germination of vigor, but perhaps not in that really good frame. But that seed still has a higher risk associated with it. Uh, it will not completely eliminate that risk with those. It will just help um, in the performance. So some of the seed-borne diseases you, or, and concepts you should consider when you're, you're looking at your seed treatment um, and seed-borne diseases that you need to deal with. First of all, not all seed-borne diseases present the same risk. And so some of them you need to pay more attention to than others. That doesn't mean you should ignore them all or, or some of these lower risk ones, and I'll talk about those as well. But uh, I, obviously anyone who's growing chickpeas, if there is ascochyta present, um, the, it will move from that seed infection into the seedling quite easily. And obviously anyone who grows chickpeas knows that the presence of ascochyta is uh, highly um, high risk, a potential for an explosive epidemic. If you look at the same organism in lentils, it's actually a low to high risk depending on the environment. So an instance of this would be whether or not you're growing that infected seed in the brown soil zone versus the black soil zone you're going to have a higher risk associated with that seed in the black soil zone than you are within the brown soil zone. And then you have field pea ascochyta. It is actually quite low risk 
even in the presence of the uh, Ascochyta marcasferala in the seed. And that's because there's a very low seed to seedling transmission rate. Um, and that's under optimal conditions for that to happen. They, we've had a very difficult time trying to actually get it to move from the seed to the seedling. That doesn't mean there isn't a risk associated with that seed, but that risk is coming from somewhere else and not the actual seedborne disease moving from the seed to seed. So I want to touch on a couple of other, other seedborne diseases. I think, um, especially from a pulse perspective, and in, in my case, I lump soybeans in with that. I know not everyone does, uh, but I do. Um, seedborne botrytis, uh, which is what you can see in, in most of our, our field pulses, or phomopsis, which is associated with soybean, those I put at moderate to high risk. If they're present, they can impact your stand density. Um, and you can see in the photo, this was seedborne um, botrytis in lentils. You can see there are misses in the rows where the seed rotted, didn't actually come up out of the ground. And you can actually see some very small yellow seedlings that have emerged from the ground and then died off. And that was due to the disease. And you can see a number of, of uh, the plants up at the top of the photo where they're becoming chlorotic, they're turning yellow. They're under stress and that's because of botrytis. Um, the seeds, uh, the roots in those seedlings aren't very well established. Those plants, uh, if they're stressed a little bit longer, will probably die. Now, the, the thing to keep in mind with, with botrytis is that after those plants die, if there's uh, good moisture or, or relatively good moisture or humidity in the air, the botrytis organism will grow on those dead seedlings and produce spores, and then it'll become an airborne infection. Um, and especially once the canopy closes, that's very hard to, to control. So it is gonna contribute to your risk, um, not just as a seedborne disease, but actually into the foliar as well. Um, Phomopsis, if anyone's growing soybeans, and I know there's probably not a huge acreage here yet, um, but that's definitely a seaborne disease that as soybean growers, will uh, you need to pay attention to. Similar sort of risk as botrytis, um, although it focuses more on the seed rot. Fusarium, Stemphilium, Bathrachnose, this isn't an exhaustive list of organisms, but most of the other ones that you're going to encounter are, are relatively low risk. They either occur at very low levels, such as the anthracnose, or they do um, low or no seed to seedling transmission. And again, that's another one of the anthracnose. Um, the stem filiums don't seem to have much of an impact at all on field performance, even though they can be present sometimes times in fairly high levels. And the fusariums are relatively uh, infrequent in occurrence, um, but sometimes they're made a note of by the uh, seed testing labs. Now, one thing you do need to remember is you can't look at the diseases in isolation. Um, the more organisms present on the seed and the more those percentages add up, the higher the risk that seed is at um, and the presence of multiple organisms can play into the soil-borne disease risk as well. So speaking of soil-borne disease, um, something to remember, all agricultural soils contain pathogens at some level. Although just because they're there doesn't mean they're going to be a problem. Environment is going to play a huge role into whether or not those organisms are going to cause you a problem. But there is uh, impact of some factors that will increase the risk associated with those organisms. And I'll run through a few of those. So as I mentioned before, seed with slow germination or poor vigor, they stay in the ground longer. They're exposed to the soil-borne organisms for a longer period of time. There's more opportunity for them to affect. Physical damage to the seed or seedling can play a critical role in how um, badly a soil borne disease can impact the, um, the performance. So this includes mechanical damage from equipment handling, and that could be um, at harvest. If you didn't adjust your concave um, appropriately and the seed was quite dry, there will be more cracking damage um, when you're augering the seed from uh, your bin into your seeder. You can um, observe damage as well. That makes it, uh, a, when you damage the seed coat, when you put that seed into the ground um, and the seed starts to imbibe water, the seed automatically starts to do a cellular repair process. And when there's mechanical damage involved, it takes longer for it to do that cellular repair and some of the exudates that come out of that seed is a little bit different than if you had used really healthy seed. And those exudates, again, they're more attractive to the seed borne or the soil borne organisms and will actually pull those organisms towards it. 
lesions on the seed coat from the seed-borne pathogens will weaken it and make it more susceptible to mechanical damage. This is where the seed-borne ascochitis in the field pea, although they won't really necessarily carry much of a risk from a seed to se uh, seedling transmission perspective, this is where they can play a role in that. Um, they weaken the seed coat, they make it more attractive to the soil-borne organisms. And then any feeding damage that occurs on the seed or roots caused by the soil-borne pests. Again, they cause damage to the cellular, at the cellular level, the plant tries to repair it, it releases exudates that are more attractive to the soil-borne organisms. <clears throat> a couple of other factors that will play a role, environmental conditions, which is pretty straightforward. If it's nice and moist um, and relatively cool, that tends to uh, be your highest risk situation, and nutritional deficiencies. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I consider the big three soil-borne diseases that you need to be aware of, although in recent years we can probably cross that out, and we've probably got the big four now, um, and I'll get into the fourth one a little bit later on. So as a lab geek, this is what I see when I look through my microscope and I'm looking for these organisms with the Pythium, the Fusarium, and Rhizotonia. Now that's not something that you're going to see. You're going to see something that looks a little bit more like this. Um, if, with the soil-borne diseases in your field, there might be plants missing. The ones that are there might be stunted. Um, you might see some wilted plants or some seedling blight where they've turned, turned a bit uh, uh, chlorotic. But it's not going to be very obvious to you which organism you're dealing with, and you won't be able to diagnose it in the field very well. That's where you want to send that away to the crop protection labs um, or some other testing lab to help you um, clarify or understand what's in your soil. Although, again, I can pretty much guarantee that somewhere in your field, you're going to have pockets of Pythium, and then there's going to be Rhizoctonia and Fusarium scattered around. Pythium <coughs> itself, um, it's not very collective. The Pythiums will go after pretty much any seed that goes into the ground. There aren't very many that they won't go after, but they really do prefer that cold, wet soil. Um, so if you're seeding early into cold soils and it, it moisture is really, really good, this is probably going to be the one that's going to cause the most havoc, and certainly in localized areas. Um, any place that retains moisture for an extended period of time, those low spots in your field, they're going to be at higher risk for Pythium exposure. And Pythium itself, it really likes the seeds. It'll go after them very quickly within 24 to 48 hours after planting. And it likes the root tips as well. So if you look at the bottom photo, you can see those tap roots and those little brown dots where there used to be root hairs, but the Pythium itself has actually nibbled away and eaten those root hairs right back to the tap root. Um, and one of the things to improve your success against Pythium is again, use fresh seed. Don't use physiological old seed. Um, um, as I mentioned, as the seed ages, um, if there's damage to the cell, you get those, those um, seed reserves dropping and then your exudates coming out of the cells and cells change. And they're very attractive to the zoo forest that Pythium produces. So the fusariums are a, a very diverse complex. Um, so when we're talking about fusariums, we're talking about multiple species and they probably all occur at some level in your field. Uh, the distribution might be variable depending on what your crop rotation is like. All of these organisms that I have listed here will at some level infect the pulses, but they will also infect a lot of other crops as well. Something to remember within the species of fusarium, individuals within that species, their pathogenicity or their aggressiveness on a particular crop may be variable. So if you grow the same crop over and over, what you do is you basically create a perfect feeding situation for a really highly aggressive organ, um, individual. But if you rotate your crop, you aren't necessarily feeding it the same, um, it's preferred crop every single time, and they don't um, reproduce and accumulate quite as quickly. So it's one of the reasons why crop rotation won't get rid of your fusarium risk, but it'll help keep it sort of at a static or lower level. Uh, something else about fusarium, they don't have one specific preferred temperature or moisture level that they, they excel at. They, all the species have some variation within them, so they're actually going to be a problem over a very wide range of environmental conditions. Um, they are capable of infecting at any growth stage, so you can get them early in the seedling. You can see at the bottom there where it causes some seedling blight. You might get it on 
some more mature roots. So you're seeing an actual root rot. Um, and some of them like to get into the vascular system, like you see at the top there. It's been affected by, uh, by fusarium and that nice bright red uh, line through the vascular tissue was the, the pathogen moving up the vascular tissue from the root into the stem. The severity actually increases when you get some intermittent wet and dry conditions. Of course, once you've had this happen, it's a little bit too late um, once you're observing those conditions because either you treated or you didn't. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind that predicting when fusariums will be a problem is probably a little bit more difficult than some of our other soil-borne organisms. From a Rhizoctonia perspective, it's also non-selective. There is probably a strain of Rhizoctonia that affects virtually every crop out there, although fortunately we don't have all of those strains in Canada. They also uh, are capable of infection at any point during the plant growth stage, but they do the most damage at the seedling stage. And just the fact that the plant is growing at all is a risk factor uh, because it is the plant exudates which attract the rhizotonia to the roots. But it does tend to be more problematic in the cool to moist soil. It doesn't like it as wet as Pythium, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, proliferate in the dry soils like you can with some of the Pythium. Uh, again, similar to the Fusarium, there's a variety of strains or AG groups, as they like to call them, within the Rhizoctonia. Um, individual groups have slightly different crop preferences, but they can survive and overwinter on different residues from different crops. Um, so again, it's important to rotate your crops because it'll help you manage the, the inoculum load in the soil of any individuals that prefer the crop, that, um, the pulse crops. Now, seed treatments aren't going to solve all of our problems, um, and obviously there are probably a number of you that are dealing with a phanomyces at this time, and we don't really have a good seed treatment tool um, to help you with that battle. Uh, it's not that we aren't trying um, and we aren't looking, but it's, it's an odd duck, and we're struggling to find something that's effective against it. Um, this organism can infect early in the season, and it will continue infecting all throughout the growing season. Most of our seed treatments aren't designed to persist in the tissues that long, so we only provide protection for a limited window, and the Aphanomyces is, is uh, definitely capable of infecting after the seed treatments wear off. And they also, um, the inoculum load, once you start to see symptomology, the inoculum load is actually at a level that isn't, the seed treatments aren't going to be very effective, and right now I think there's only one on the market that even attempts. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But some of you are probably asking why is it so problematic and why don't we have one active ingredient that can work against all of the fungi? So this is a very stylized view of, let's call it the evolutionary tree um, of organisms. And it's very simplified. And uh, just to give you an idea, so our bacteria are the oldest. They've been around for millennia. Um, and as time went past, Groups like the, the club root organism that is problematic in canola shot off or developed off. And then a little bit later, the umycetes, which include the pythium and the aphanomyces um, and the phytophthoras and the downy mildew. Those shot off a little bit later. And then your plants came off. And then a little bit after that, fungi actually evolved out. And what we call the true fungi. And these are, um, there's two main groups that we deal with, the basidiomycetes and the ascomycetes. Your basidiomycetes are your rhizoctonia and smuts and bunts, um, and then your ascomycetes, which is the biggest group that we typically need to deal with from a, um, a crop production and pest management perspective, are your ascochyta, your betritus, your freezerium, anthracnose, the mopsus, cochleobolus in the, in the common root rots and cereals. Um, you don't have to remember much about these. Really, the only thing you need to, to recognize from this is that evolutionarily um, and from a relatedness perspective, Although we talk about fungicides for use against umycetes and club roots and the rhizoctonias and the ascochytes, they aren't all true fungi. Um, so a typical fungicide is not going to work against all of them. Um, and some of those, those older um, groups, I'll call it, the umycetes, the club roots, uh, they have different cell wall structures. They have slightly different metabolisms and metabolic pathways versus our true fungi in the psidiomycetes and ascomycetes. And, and that's why we have to work quite a bit harder to try and identify some um, compounds that will be effective against them and give you guys some more tools. Right now, we're quite limited with the umycetes, um, and some of them, obviously, like ephanomycetes, we don't really have a good tool available for you. 
We're much more familiar with the Basidiomyces and Ascomyces, and even within those true fungi, not all actives are equally strong against both groups. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about those as well. So I've got one short blurb on insect pests um, and helping to identify where your risk factors are coming in. Uh, pest pressures tend to be a little bit more localized and they're often sporadic. They're not necessarily as consistent. Um, you will often have, or, or you're at risk for a, a pest issue a year after you've already had one, but that doesn't mean that you will necessarily have one. And if you go into a new field that you haven't been in for a while, um, you may or may not have a, a problem even if it wasn't in a pulse crop the year before. Most important thing here is know your cropping history and keep track of past problems because that's going to guide you the best. And pay attention to your reservoir areas, your shelter belts, um, the ditches, are there, um, are the weeds or the grasses um, or any of the, the wildflowers growing in the in the, those reservoir areas, are they hosts for some of the potential um, insects that could infect your pulses? I was throwing up a photo of uh, some a pea leaf weevil there with some pea leaf weevil damage. Uh, I forgot actually to throw in my wireworm photo, so I apologize for that. <clears throat> so, how do you actually about now that you've kind of understood your risk factors, got an idea for where what organisms you need to target, how do you actually select the seed treatments. Um, and reading labels, in some days, it's, it's a bit confusing. Verbiage around the label claims can vary greatly from product to product, and that makes it very difficult to compare products directly to know which one is a better option for you. Although there is a very dis real possibility that there may be multiple products out there that will provide you similar performance and suit your needs, and it just comes down to your personal preference. Um, but when you're reading these labels, when they talk about the, the, the claims against the organisms, words like seed rust, pre-emergence damping off, post-emergence damping off, seedling blight, they can all be caused by the same pathogen. So they're not necessarily all different strains or individuals of, let's say, fusarium that are causing those different symptomologies. It's the same organism. It's just that the symptom itself has been given a different name. And that is something that um, in the early days of plant pathology, we didn't know necessarily what was causing all of these symptoms. And they thought because they were occurring at, at a different growth stage, that perhaps it was a different pathogen. We now know that's not true, uh, but that terminology and that, that uh, nameology, I'll call it, of the symptoms has persisted. And it makes it a little bit confusing. Um, and, and just so you're aware that if a label says that um, a product is good for seed rot, and post-emergence damping off and seedling blight, you can assume that it's also good for pre-emergence damping off. It's just when they were registering that product, they may not have had that particular symptom show up in their research trial. And so the reviewer at the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, which was going through the data, wouldn't let them put that term onto their label because they didn't have specific data for that symptomology. Um, and that comes back to, there are evolving data requirements within the PMRA. Um, so when an organization submits their, their product for registration, what the requirements are at that time will sometimes dictate what they're allowed to put on their label. And if they had registered it earlier or perhaps a few years later, that terminology may have been loosened or tightened up depending on um, that time frame and actually on the particular reviewer themselves. Not all of the reviewers at the PMRA who would look at a seed treatment are necessarily pathologists and so they might be a little bit more stringent in following um, rules and not understanding um, some of the pathology behind it and what it means. Um, and I know that doesn't necessarily help you a lot when you're looking at labels. Um, just be aware that sometimes you can be a little bit um, uh, lenient in how you interpret them and sometimes it, it, it is a little bit more critical and some of those are um, when you're talking about seedborne pathogens. So active ingredients can have a different efficacy on the same pathogen if it is seedborne versus soilborne and that's something we see more so in the cereals but it is a consideration uh, within the pulses as well and again there's not a good way for you as, as a grower to understand which active ingredient is necessarily the strongest um, but mostly, usually you just need something that's going to be good enough as long as you're um, um, getting good application and you're managing a lot of the other risk factors. And I'll talk more about that as well. 
the other thing about reading labels, especially with the increasing complexity with multiple actives in a single product, um, it's not clear which active ingredients are actually working against which organisms, and that makes it a little bit um, confusing at times. So I have taken it upon myself to separate out some of the active ingredients and then show you the products associated, and then I've made some comments based on my own personal experience. Um, there may not necessarily be a lot of hard data to back this up, so please take it with a grain of salt. You can make your own opinions as well. From an umycete perspective, so this is looking specifically for Pythium, really there's only um, two actives registered on the market. So Ethoboxum is the newest one, it's in the Tigo Solo, it's a contact only. Um, it seems to have some good efficacy on Pythium, and they've got a suppression claim for Ephanomyces, but in my personal opinion, quite frankly, once you're at the level where you've got symptomology in the field with a phenomyces, you're probably past the point where the ethoboxin is going to provide you much benefit. There's just going to be too much inoculum there for it to handle. And the other active is the metalaxyl, metalaxlem, methanoxin. Um, they have different names. I'll tell you a little bit why. Metalaxyl is made up of two isomers. One of them is biologically active. One of them is not. Um, and Syngenta was able to come up with a manufacturing process which uh, better concentrated that biologically active isomer, and they were able to remove a, a good portion of that inactive isomer, but it's still the same active isomer that is present in the metalaxyl, metalaxylam, or methanoxum, as some people like to call it. So um, they're grouped together because they do the exact same thing, they're active, uh, they have the same mode of action, they have the same risk factors from a resistance management perspective. But it's systemic, um, and they're very strong on the Pythium. In fact, it's probably the, that active is, is the best, best active we have versus Pythium um, on the market right now. And quite frankly, there aren't any at this time, not for, not for lack of effort or looking, that's for sure. Um, when you look at the true fungi, you've got a lot more selection, um, you've got some contact and systemics. Uh, some of these are relatively old active ingredients. I would have had them in the early modern actives versus in what I consider the true modern um, compounds. And they vary in their ability to manage different organisms. And if you're in a low risk category for pretty much everything, you, you may be able to get away with one of the, um, uh, I'll say, not premium products. Uh, maybe one that has, maybe it's not strong, but it's good. Um, you can get away with those. And, and, and sometimes if you've got no risk factors and it fits in your, your uh, operation, um, some of those older ones might still, might still fit into your, into your particular production system. Um, although there's certainly, uh, it, in my mind, their, their time has probably passed. Um, but I've got a variety here. In my personal opinion, if you're in a high risk factor, you definitely want to have something that's active against the Pythium, Rhizoctonia, um, and the Ascomycetes from a soil borne perspective. So, I mean, from a strong, very strong perspective for Rhizoctonia, uh, the Plexipyroxid, the Sidaxane, the Pantolupin, uh, those are the, the SDHIs. They're the newest, pretty much some of the newest uh, actives to the market, and they are by far. Um, the strongest against rhizoctonia, but it's, you don't necessarily need the strongest. Sometimes you just need the good, um, and there's a number of options there for the, the products containing fludioxinol, um, some of the, the um, uh, trifoxystrobins, uh, um, carboxins. So there are some options there, um, and just sort of know when you're getting into a high risk category, you might want to go to those premium products, as I'll call them, but sometimes you don't need to. Um, and it just comes down to what risk you're comfortable with and um, what sort of, of risk factors you're facing. From an insect perspective, really there's only two on the market right now for, uh, for the pulses, and the clopres bimethoxam. They're both highly systemic and they're both quite good at what they do, um, protecting from wire worms and from the pea leaf needle. So, um, there are some other considerations that might be important to you beyond just efficacy. Inoculate compatibility, obviously with pulses, that will be a factor, and that information for each of those seed treatments is available from the inoculant company. They will provide you with guidance on how best to use them in combination with those seed treatments. Whether or not a particular formulation is a fit for your operation, 
um, you know your equipment, so and a lot of you probably have previous experience with, with some of the products on the market. You know how well it handles in your equipment. Um, you may have a preference for a ready-to-use formulation versus something that's co-packed and requires you to tank mix. Uh, sometimes you just don't care. Sometimes you need the flexibility of a concentrate so that you can add in that insecticide component. Um, whether or not it's easy to clean up, how big of a factor is that to you? Are you gonna be doing early treating versus just in time treating? And are you gonna be treating multiple crops in a short span of time? Do you want a formulation that you can use in multiple crops? Or are you willing to, to um, use a premium product um, for each specific crop to, to maximize your, your um, protection? And it all comes down to what works best in your operation um, and what you value the most or, or what's gonna be the biggest concern to you. The other thing that might be a consideration is whether or not you're going to get some product support from the manufacturer. Um, some of the organizations are very good. They have dedicated technical people that will help you troubleshoot if you have an issue while you're treating. Um, not everyone does. Um, so that might be a consideration. And sometimes you can leverage your purchase for better programming. And I am the last person you want to ask about that. Um, I just know it's available. <laughs> I just don't know any of the details. Um, but it might be something that you want to consider because it might get you into some um, better options in your foliar program and into your other crops as well. So you've picked your seed treatments, um, you've gone through your risk factors, picked your treatment. How do you get the most out of that seed treatment that you, you've selected? Um, and one of the things that you can do is obviously follow your label directions very closely. That's important. Store your product appropriately, especially if you have it, if you have a jug of something from last year. Um, hopefully you stored it in a where, uh, an area that it wasn't going to undergo some free thaw. That would be good. Um, calibrate your treating equipment. Now, I am not an equipment person, uh, but I do know that if you don't calibrate your treating equipment, you're not going to get the optimal application rate, um, and, and you're going to do yourself actually a bit of a disservice um, once you've made that investment into your seed treatment. The other thing you can do is maintain your treating equipment and clean your treating equipment. Um, you will get residue buildup. Uh, to some degree, doesn't matter what uh, formulation you use, some of them are more problematic than others. Um, but it's critical that you, you actually keep your treating equipment at optimal performance. Do not mix a third party product with your seed treatment without doing a mix test first. Uh, and I say even then be cautious. Sometimes when you mix a third party product in with the seed treatments, um, yet the impact isn't immediately obvious. Um, in this picture, uh, and this is not a pulse treatment, we had taken a third party. Yeah. They wanted to know if their product could be mixed with, with ours, and just I had some time, so I threw it in a bottle, and it came out of sludge, and that happened within 30 seconds. Um, obviously, not a good mix partner. Um, and so I highly recommend, if you're going to mix something outside of what that actual seed treatment product is, that you be very cautious to do the test. The other thing to remember, sometimes the, the third party product will uh, bind with the active ingredient and precipitate it out of the formulation. So you might not see this sludge. You might get a sediment down at the bottom of your, your um, tank, which you may not be aware of immediately. Um, and it may actually bind it and take it out of, of availability to the plant, especially with some of the systemics. So keep that in mind. The other thing that I would recommend is if you have a tank mix made up, don't carry it over for an extended period of time. And my recommendation to commercial seed treaters is 72 hours. You don't want to keep your tank mix past 72 hours. And there's a few reasons for that. First of all, that formulation you get in the jug, it has been optimized for its physical stability and chemical stability in that jug. The moment you, you dilute it with water or you mix it with other components, you change the ratios of those components and you change the physical, um, the physical characteristics of that mix. And so that could be a concern. Again, um, you could result in some sedimentation. Those um, suspension agents that were in there aren't going to be enough necessarily once you've diluted it with water to keep everything suspended well. And keeping that in mind, agitate. Keep that moving um, because once you do that tank mix, as I said, you, you change those ratios. It won't stay suspended quite as well as the actual formulation in the jug. So make sure you keep um, um, agitating your slurry tanks, uh, whatever you need to do while you're doing your treatment. It will ensure that you get um, even distribution of those components. 
Um, impact of application quality. I'm going to apologize. I didn't have a pulse photo, for example, so I pulled out um, an ancient serial photo that I inherited from Gustafson, but it illustrates exactly um, what the impact can be. So you have your seeds, and you can see in the cereal seeds that there are some seeds that are very heavily colored and then some that aren't colored at all. This is what I would call a bad treatment. Um, poor application, um, poor distribution, it's uneven. Some seeds got a lot of products, some got none at all. Some probably got the right rate. But if you look to the left, you have your untreated seeds. You have a petri plate which had a good distribution. There's still um, organisms growing, but most of it's nice and clean. Um, your poor distribution, you see a lot more of the organisms growing. And then they, they went in and they selected uh, dark seeds, which indicated that it seemed to have gotten more treatment versus the light colored seed where it didn't get much treatment at all. And you can see that obviously from a seed borne perspective, um, that those untreated or light colored seeds obviously had a lot more, uh, it, it didn't perform as it should have. It should look like that even distribution petri dish um, up in the top right and it, it does not. Um, if you don't get enough active ingredient onto the seed, it can't work for that seed. And that uh, plays into seed borne disease and also soil borne disease. If you don't get any product or enough product on the seed, you're not going to have it protected. Oh, sorry, I forgot about that. Um, appropriate expectations. Uh, seed treatments are not silver bullets. They all have um, some weak points in all of the formulations that are out there. And under severe pest pressures, the seed treatment may be insufficient to prevent damage. So in an insect pressures, um, most of the, the active ingredients, the insects actually need to ingest them. And that means they need to take a bite out of the plant in order to be exposed to that active ingredient. So you will always see some feeding damage associated with pest pressures. The thing is, they won't come back for that second, third, and fourth bite. Um, and that's where you get that should be a significant reduction in feeding damage. And in some cases, if you don't um, treat, and I see this more with canola actually, if you don't have that seed treatment um, insecticide on there, you don't have time to get a foliar spray over top. The other thing is with the disease levels, if you there is too much inoculum, it'll overwhelm the seed treatment. Um, it's I hate it when people use the word disease control. Um, when it comes to disease management and seed treatments in particular, you don't actually control anything fully. You only manage it and you will have a better level of, of management um, under moderate and low disease pressures versus those really, really high. Um, but you will still have significant protection under the high, high levels. The other thing to keep in mind, seed treatments are designed to provide protection during germination and emergence to ensure you have a healthy stand. They do not last indefinitely throughout that um, growing season. And so there will be a window um, or you know, those first couple of weeks, that's the critical phase for the, for the seed treatments to work. And that's when they can provide you your best protection. They aren't very effective against pests or pathogens that come in later or that are capable of infecting the course of growing season. And that goes back to the uh, aphanomyces um, and some of the insect pests that you might see. And quality application is critical. Equipment's come a long way, but there are still issues with it. Not all equipment is created equal. Um, you use the best equipment available to you to get the best application quality. That's my best recommendation. Um, and if you've calibrated your equipment really well and you, you pay close attention, sometimes you can get away with what um, some folks might refer to a lower standard of seed treating equipment. Um, but if you follow and manage it with the best your ability, you, you can still have a very good application. So just wanted to revisit our risk triangle. Um, you now kind of understand a bit more about these components and hopefully you'll be able to have a better idea of figuring out where your risk is. Every time you have a risk factor, throw it into that triangle and take a look at how many you have there at the end of the, your analysis. Um, one of the quick notes, I just want to give you guys a, 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 an idea of what it takes to get the seed treatment product to the market. Um, I work, I'm in that green phase, that's where I work. So prior to anything coming to me from, uh, let's say Germany, it's already been looked at for a couple of years by our discovery group over in Monheim. Um, and then I get to look at it and I, depending on how complex it is and what it can do, it may take two to eight years for us to fully characterize a brand new active ingredient. Actually that eight years is more towards brand new active ingredients. The two years might be moving that active ingredient into a new formulation or crop or looking at a new emerging disease. 
But it takes a lot of effort to get these seed treatments to market. They don't happen overnight. It takes a lot of effort. Um, and then once we get it submitted, it takes a little while for the pest management regulatory agency to actually review all the data and award us the registration. I mean, so you can look upwards of 14 years before something that's discovered on a lab bench um, ends up actually in your hands as a commercial product. And tying into that, I'm always looking for help to help me move this green bar that I live in a little bit faster. And so I'm putting a plug out there um, to help me do some of my work. Um, we're, we're hopefully we can partner with someone who has had the unfortunate um, fortunate experience to have a phanomyces in their field. If you're interested in partnering with us to help us do a screening trial, um, give me a call. Or if you have any seed that's been diseased, and we typically look for something with a 5% infection level or higher. Um, and we are constantly looking for more seed and combinations to test any of our screening materials that are going on. And, and we're constantly looking at something new um, pretty much every year. So I'd appreciate any assistance you can have um, or can give me. That would be fantastic. And that is the end of my presentation. So hopefully we have a few minutes for, for some questions. Um, we really appreciate your time and uh, sharing all of your knowledge with us today, Krista. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for questions. So again, if you have any questions, please feel free to type the question into the question box on the GoToWebinar screen, and we will do our best to get it answered for you. A uh, couple questions, Krista. One, you talked about risks of disease if you can put the right rate of seed treatment on your seed. Is there a risk of putting too high a rate or too much seed treatment on? Or what if you just have the odd spot that's not covered on a particular seed? So, well, those are multiple questions. Um, putting too much on, I, I mean, there is a, a, a bit of a window where you're, you, you will have no problems at all. Um, typically, when we test it, we're, if you're within 10%, which is actually pretty accurate, if you're within 10%, you will have no issues. In a lot of instances, if you put too much on, you might not necessarily, from a disease perspective, you won't have a problem. Um, some of the actives, and, and I, I, I haven't tested all of them, so I couldn't comment on specific ones. Sometimes you will see um, some seed safety or phytotoxicity issue. Your biggest issue might be with the MRLs, um, and if there's residues that are then in the plant afterwards, um, when they're growing um, from a foraging perspective, if you have animals that get in there to feed, that might be a risk, but um, fairly low. Um, the rates we use in seed treatments are actually quite low. So there's, there's a lot of safety factor built in there. If you don't get every single spot on a seed, if you're looking, working with the contacts, that can, that's more of an issue because they need to be in that direct contact. Um, and they don't come off the seed coat necessarily. Your systemics, um, if you've got a couple of little spots that aren't covered, you're okay because the systemics by nature, they come off the seed coat a little bit and the plant actually absorbs it. Um, but again, you want to get a similar amount of active ingredient distributed to each seed so it is available um, to that seed. So having consistent and even distribution and coverage is, is pretty critical. Or, and it will play a role for sure. Um, there might be a little bit of leniency. Hopefully that wasn't too long-winded. <laughs> perfect, thank you. Um, another question just around, you had mentioned nutritional deficiencies. Do you have any additional information on how significant those are? Like what nutritional deficiencies would make one need to consider using a seed treatment? And are any nutrients more important in that decision than others? Oh, that is definitely an area outside of my expertise. Um, really what I'm confident in saying is if you're putting your seed into an environment where they aren't going to have their full nutritional profile, where they may not be as vigorous as a, as a plant or a seedling, um, because they're not as vigorous, their defense mechanisms aren't working fully, they're at a higher risk um, from that perspective. So um, if it's the sole risk factor, uh, it may not be a big of an issue, but when you start compounding and adding those risk factors together, it may may uh, be that one that you know kind of is the tipping point. Um, but it, that'll come down to how how um, depleted that particular nutrient is, and and that area is not where I where um, I can offer a lot of guidance. No problem. Thank you, Krista. Um, 
another question, just wondering what risks are there with using a seed treatment and an inoculant if you don't, you know, follow, say you just put the two together and you don't go and check with the manufacturer, what, what are the risks? So the inoculants are, um, they're a bacteria, they're a gram negative bacteria. They're not very robust organisms. Um, they're actually quite sensitive to chemical changes. Um, and so when you mix them uh, or put them on the seed together with a chemical, and keep in mind, some of the formulations have biocides in them to prevent bacterial growth in the formulations themselves. Um, if they're exposed to these chemicals for an extended period of time, uh, it won't be an instantaneous um, impact necessarily. But if they're exposed uh, for an extended period of time, um, it, that risk for the inoculant actually increases over time. So it's good to check with the, the inoculant company, see what that that window is. And I mean, if you're doing a side banding or or you know putting it through the you know, I don't know the fertilizer um, uh, lines when you're doing your seeding, you're at a pretty low risk because you're not actually physically putting them together. But when you are putting them on the seed together, you should be aware of that because you also want to get the maximum out of your inoculants as well. Perfect. Thank you, Krista. Um, if there's any more questions, we'll uh, hold on for another minute or so while we go through some um, so just some reminders. But uh, really appreciate your answers to those questions, Krista. Just a quick reminder for CCAs that an email will be coming out to you and you will need to reply with your CCA number in order to get your credits. And again, feel free to provide any suggestions for future webinar topics at the same time. We are always open to feedback and suggestions and appreciate your input. And thank you once again, Krista, for speaking to us today on Seed Treatments and Pulses. And thank you to Andrea for organizing the session today. And a very big thank you to all of the participants for taking time out of your day to join us. As a reminder, please mark on your calendars our next webinar, which will take place on April 11th at noon. And it will, the topic will be covering micronutrients in pulse production. You can sign up for this webinar from the SPG website under the News and Events tab. We appreciate all your time and have a great day, everyone.